What is theater? The performative art form we call theater has been heavily associated with disguise, deception, illusion. It has also worked as a metaphor for human behavior. A certain complexity peculiar to theater lies in the necessary involvement of both artist and watcher, actor and spectator, creator and receptor. It seems to be the most derivative form of art, since all other art forms can and usually do contribute to the art of theater, and simultaneously the most independent, since it requires none of them. The only necessary condition of theater is human action in the forms of acting and watching, taking place in a shared spatiotemporal context. Some theorists might argue that theater is in fact dependent on at least one form of art, literature. Therefore, it is nothing but interpretation of the dramatic text. This approach is called literary theory. Literary theory prioritizes the literary or written aspect of theater over the performative one, which basically means that whatever happens on stage is predetermined by the text. This theory reflects, to some degree, a subconscious distrust of the performative aspect of theater. Opposition to literary theory in the form of performance theories has also been of great interest. These view theater as independent of the dramatic text. The strengths of this approach become apparent if one considers the instances of improvisational theater. Even if we don't accept a performance theory of some sorts, we must admit that, for once, these approaches manage to recognize the performative aspect of theater as its most characteristic and vital. But why has performance, and subsequently theater as a performative art, been so controversial? Jonas Barish, in his book The Anti-Theatrical Prejudice, discusses the observable tendency within the Western canon to be critical of theatrical practice and performativity. This opposition usually concerns the morality of theatre. The famous statesman Solon called Thespis, the dramatist often credited as the inventor of tragedy, a liar. Plato also saw in theatre a kind of illusion. Plato's condemnation of theatre is based on the supposition that theatre is inherently antithetical to the search for knowledge and truth. And since theatre is an illusory practice, it is also capable of influencing people's emotions and actions in a negative manner. Interestingly enough, some biographers of Plato write that he himself wrote poems and tragedies in his youth, but gave up once he became acquainted with Socrates. Aristotle, on the other hand, denies that theatre is an illusion, believing instead that it is a form of imitation, mimesis, that can be a source of knowledge and doesn't function as a negative influence on people's emotions, since catharsis re-establishes emotional balance. He nevertheless considers the performative aspect of tragedy the least refined. Aristotelian catharsis has been very influential to the understanding of theatre's emotional impact. Catharsis takes place simultaneously with the plot's climax and works as a moral purification, where moral order is re-established, and as a structural purification, where the tragic deed is balanced through its justified payback. This theory sees tragedy as homeopathic. Tragedy raises negative emotions of fear and pity in order to clear the mind of those very emotions. This can be further applied to explain why we derive pleasure from all art, regardless of its painful subjects. A lot of Western canon's theatrical distrust was enhanced by virulent ecclesiastical efforts to suppress theatrical practice. Indicative of this intense, anti-theatrical opposition is Tertullian's view of theatre as essentially idolatrous, since it has pagan origins. Tertullian writes, The author of truth loves no falsehood, all that is feigned is adultery in his sight. The man who counterfeits voice, sex, age, he will not approve, for he condemns all hypocrisy. On the other hand, the Neoplatonists are much more lenient towards theatrical practices, since the Neoplatonic god is a god of emanation and never-ending change. For example, the Neoplatonist Pico della Mirandola in his oration on the dignity of man discusses man's mutability of character and the transformations he's capable of while navigating the stage of the world. A humanist, 
De la Mirandola sees Mons hegemony over the world as a direct result of his free choice and indeterminable nature. You can be anything you choose to. The decisive dramatistic turn, though, takes place in the 19th century, with Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche. As we saw previously, theater for some came to represent an opposing force against the quest for truth and knowledge. But to what degree is the assumption that theater is an elaborate lie correct? Let's consider what theater is or can be described as for a moment. Theater is a process of humans acting and humans watching that isn't identical to everyday life. Even though it can look identical to life outside of theatrical contexts, it still isn't exactly the same. Since no one blames the audience for being liars, to what degree are actors culpable for lying? At first glance, they're obviously guilty of pretense. For example, some man named George pretends to be Hamlet, a Kabukio Nagata actor assumes a traditionally feminine identity on stage, while not identifying with it outside of theatrical contexts. An ancient Greek guy puts on a mask and says Antigone's monologue out loud. So basically, an actor will deliberately pretend to be someone else for a couple of moments, thus engaging in a seemingly deceitful practice. Let's now consider a few things. Lying is usually described as a deliberate act so we have to wonder to what degree actors are, if they are, deliberate liars. If I lie to you, I'm expecting you to be completely unsuspecting in order to be fooled. That is not the case with acting and theater. The theatrical context implies a mutual agreement on the fact that what you're going to witness is not real. Considering the audience is most of the time participating passively by being aware of their role as observers, this can't be a case of lying, since both parties are cognizant of what is going on. It seems to me that theatre, in comparison to other forms of art, is more susceptible to criticism exactly because its medium is human beings. We wouldn't call a painter a liar for painting a tree, because we know that the painter doesn't imply the painted tree is a real tree. I believe it all boils down to this. Either actors are somehow agents capable of being someone else momentarily, or they are stable agents. If A is true, then actors are the character, albeit not literally, in the sense that the character is something like a garment you wear in spatial occasions. You become the king by wearing the king's clothes, and you become the character by doing as the character does. This way, the actor works as an embodied signifier and the character as the signified. If this is too good to be true, then we have to accept B. Actors are stable agents and they don't quote-unquote become someone else. But reading the relationship between actor and character as a relationship of signifier and signified works here as well, in the sense that the actor shows us what someone else says and does. But this isn't lying, it is an extreme form of direct speech. Acting becomes a multifarious form of direct speech, and the agreed-upon context of theatre serves as its quotation marks. What if theatre becomes a ritual which reveals the human subconscious through the interaction of actor and spectator, of performance and text, of active and passive elements? The allegorical concept of Teatro Mundi can perhaps shed some light on the ways everyday life is a performance in itself, on what it means to be an actor pretending to be yourself, navigating the stage of the world. This way we can see that theatre is less mimetic than we might think. It isn't imitating life, but it is life itself.